Well, let me remind you of some history. If you think that you are safe from inflation because there are lots of gaps, here I have unemployment on the bottom and inflation vertically. The Fed has just told you that this looks like a beautifully negatively sloped curve, that, that you get that less unemployment gives you more inflation and more employment, unemployment gives you less inflation. I don't see a negatively sloped curve there. I mean, it seems to go up or down. And let me remind you of, of those of us old enough to remember what our teenage years in the 1970s looked like. Again, the theory the Fed just expressed is there's a negatively sloped curve here. I don't see any negatively sloped curves. And it, the, what the Fed just told you was, relax, don't worry, because as long as there is substantial unemployment, uh, if, if unemployment is, is high, you won't see any inflation. So let's remember like 1974, unemployment was, was what was then considered very high, 5%, inflation shot up. The same thing happened again, 78, 79, unemployment already at 7%, a historical high. We'd never seen anything like that. Inflation shot up. So uh, inflation can come, especially, I mean, when was the last time you saw a, a fiscal inflation coincident with a boom? If inflation, especially caused by fiscal events, uh, was, was, gave you a boom, then Zimbabwe would be the richest country in the world by, by zeros and zeros and zeros. Inflation comes with bad times, not with good times. Well, uh, let us move on to the euro, which I did promise to talk about a little bit. On that cheery note, let us move on to the euro. <laughs> I should say, I am a great, so I'll allow one personal opinion and then go back to something I think is defensible by economic theory. I, I love the euro. Um, uh, I love the meter. The euro is, was almost the perfect currency, sort of the universal standard of value. And, and it, you know, the, the Germans keep track of that in, in Frankfurt. The French keep the meter in Paris, and everything's right. Uh, it's a standard of value set out to be divorced from recession fighting and, and, and worrying about jobs in eastern Kansas and all the things that our Federal Reserve is contaminated with in its job. It, it's, a, it's the gold standard for a modern era, or at least it was until Greece came along. Now, within the context of, of our, you know, what can I say new about the euro in the context of, of our equation? For an individual country like Greece, or I hate to say it, like Portugal, um, this, uh, this equation works very differently. And when you, when you are the US and you can print money, your government debt is like equity. Uh, it's like stock in the country because you, if, you, if the, the right-hand side is wanting, the left-hand side can inflate so that the real value of nominal government debt on the left-hand side, that can go down because the price level goes, go, goes up. Just as a company that has issued equity, if we all discover that the treasurer went to Rio with, with all the profits, then the price of that company can go down and, and, and therefore bring left and right side into equilibrium. For a small country, for, for any country that borrows in foreign currency, this is no longer allowed. If you borrowed in foreign currency and the expected discounted surpluses vanish, then you, do not, you can't inflate. I mean, you can hope that the Germans inflate for you, but if they don't, you can't inflate, so you have to default. A country that borrows in other currency has issued debt, real debt, debt that must be paid back or defaulted on. Whereas a country that borrows in its own money has issued equity, and equity can be inflated away. That's a big difference in, in thinking how it works. I mean, the equations are still there, but um, now you have issued really debt, and your choices are your. Uh, a country that does this, its choices are pay it back, hope to get bailed out, or default. And inflated away is no longer an option. Now, in thinking about what happened after the Greek event, and what may happen in the future. I think there's a lot of muddy thinking. One muddy proposition, many people seem to think that a currency union, such as the euro, requires a fiscal union, requires a political union, uh, requires that we all worry about each other's debts. That is not true. Uh, remember the gold standard. <laughs> under the gold standard, the entire world was under a currency union. We agreed to denominate things in terms of gold coins. It may not have been perfect, but it did not require any fiscal union whatsoever. Any country who wanted to was free to use gold coins. And as a currency, it worked well. But of course, 
under that system, if you have a currency union without a fiscal union, then those who borrow in that currency must default uh, if, if they can't pay their debt back, exactly like a company. If a company borrows, we don't have to bail out every company just because a comp company borrows in dollars to defend the dollar. I mean, many people in our government seem to think we have to bail out every large company just because they borrowed in dollars, but it's not true. <laughs> and the dollar is much better off as a currency if we, if we don't do that. Similarly, currency, you shouldn't have to apply for the euro. If it's a currency union, just join on your own. So as anyone can use the meter, you can use the euro. So a currency union can work, and probably works best when it doesn't have a fiscal union. Currency union can work fine with a, a full fiscal union. Uh, in that case, we, we don't have country defaults because we've all agreed to, to pay each other's debts. At least we all inflate together. The worst possible arrangement, of course, is a currency union with a sort of a fiscal union, with, with implicit bailouts that might come or might not come, sort of like what we around the world have just agreed to do with our banks. Well, uh, well maybe we'll bail them out, maybe we won't bail them out. Uh, the system there is, is you spend, I print, but worst of all, it's not really clear whether we will or won't bail out, so there's a lot of speculation and crises and, uh, you know, instead of investors looking at countries and, and deciding if they can pay their debts, they have to go in, instead, instead to uh, uh, the ECB or, or to politicians and see, are they going to sneeze today? Um, uh, you know, that, that's not a good system. And, and worse, uh, you know, how we got into the Greek, it's worth thinking through the Greek crisis. Uh, for how the euro should be restructured. Now, let's remember, Greece didn't really get bailed out. What got bailed out was Greece's creditors. Normally, what happens when you can't pay back your debts, let's not get too scared about default. It's, there's not some big crater in the ground. Normally, what happens is, when you can't pay back your debts, you sit down with the debt holders, and you agree on a write-down, a rescheduling, and then they kind of get to, get, get to say no, and you've got to fire some public workers or seize some assets. Or, you know, that's, that's what default means. In the case of the, of the Greek crisis, nobody who had lent money to Greece, no matter how irresponsible, was forced to take one cent of a write-down. Now, what's up with that? That's who got bailed out. Well, of course, it turned out who got bailed out was banks, <laughs> who was holding the Greek debt, a bunch of largely French and German banks, who had the brilliant idea of let's hold Greek debt with no CDS coverage and earn the great spreads we get to earn. Now, how did they get to do that? a year after the worst financial crisis in a century. Well, because the regulators said they could. Oh, it's sovereign debt, don't worry about this. What this whole horrible story should remind you of, I'll talk a little bit about bank regulation, if you have faith that just unleashing an army of regulators on, say, Citigroup, and making sure that they're gonna not take any risks this time, if you have any faith in that system, take a look at the entire, the European bank regulators who failed to notice that banks were uh, taking on huge sovereign risk with no, no coverage. And this is like plain vanilla compared to what Citi wants to do. At a minimum, <laughs> uh, getting the banks out of this game has to be part of the story. Having them recognize that if you're holding sovereign debt and you're a bank in Europe and you're holding sovereign debt, you are holding sovereign debt risk and, 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 and you're, if you're too big to fail, then that's the mechanism for, for making the bailout more likely. Now, often it's said that, that maybe we should leave the euro, uh, that, that you know, the euro was, you know, small countries should have their own currency, and that there's an optimal currency area. And lots of economists like this idea. Maybe the euro is a bad idea overall. Uh, I think that's a terrible point of view. The, the point of view is that, that uh, uh, an occasional devaluation is a great idea, that if you get into, if you, if you borrow too much money or, or have an external deficit, why, we'll just devalue the currency a little bit. Now, by the way, that's not going to help Portugal right now, because if you have borrowed in euros, leaving the euro is a default. So you don't avoid a default just by changing the euro. So it's more a, a hypothetical question. Maybe we shouldn't encourage so much euro anyway, and everyone should have their own country. Um, now, I, I, I think that's a terrible idea. Is occasional devaluation the secret of wealth? Well, let me remind you, the drachma over its many years was devalued many, many times and somehow Greece did not become the richest country in Europe as a result. I mean, when is it optimal to raise the value of your currency? If the answer is never, then we just have a recipe for, for unending defl inflation. And in addition, let me ask a historical question. How did England win 
the hundred years of warfare that ended up as the Napoleonic Wars against France? The answer is government debt. Government debt's a great thing. The, the England was smaller. It, was, it had far less tax revenue. How did they ever wind up win winning this war? Well, pre-commitment. The English king had a parliament to whom he had to answer, and he couldn't welch on his debts without going through parliament. The French king was much more powerful. He could welch on his debts any time he felt like it, and as a result, did frequently. So pre-commitment to pay back your debts ex post is what gives you the opportunity to raise money ex ante, and this is not a new lesson. What I think happens when you join the euro is you all of a sudden make it much, much harder to devalue. Precisely what our economist friends who want you to devalue say you ought to do is now nearly impossible. You have to at least go through the chaos of formal default. You can't just have a little devaluation or, or, or a little bit of inflation. That's a big pre-commitment. Um, you know, that, that's like Ulysses tying himself to the mast before going through the Straits of Gibraltar. Pre-commitment is often a good idea to keep you from doing things bad thing ex post. And in the case of debt, if you pre-commit that it's going to be harder to welch on the debt, it's much easier to borrow in the first place. And all of Europe experienced this. When Greece, Portugal, Italy, and Ireland joined the euro, famously interest rates went down. Now one story for this is that everybody read the Maastricht Treaty and, and saw the, the line in it that said there will be no bailouts and said, ha, 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 I don't believe that one. So this is just the, the value of the, of the uh, too big to fail or bailout premium. But another equally good story is, oh, you guys have tied yourself to the mast. You can't devalue your way out. Now you get to pay much lower interest rates, much lower credit spread, and we're going to send you a lot of money. And we're going to put stuff on trucks and send it to you as well. You, you are, by pre-committing not, uh, not to have this strategy so many uh, economists advocate of, of occasionally devaluing, you get to borrow a lot more money. Now you may say, well, uh, that was great, except at least Greece pretty obviously wasted all the resources that were lent on it. So maybe the argument then must be, well, uh, debt's a bad thing, so we'll cut ourselves off from the world and have our own country uh, because that's our only way to keep ourselves from wasting all the money we save. Well, sir, it's well, okay. But if that is true, at least, uh, do you really believe in this wise central bank who will only devalue when necessary and not when politically expedient, which is the central case for, for having a uh, uh, it seems to me like an awful idea. Now, on the, on the, let me try to be a little bit more, let's try to find something positive to say. Default is chaotic, even if it's handled as sort of a write down. Fiscal union is not happening, which I think is a good thing. But um, a commitment, a clear commitment that, that countries will, will, uh, will have to default is not happening either. So can we offer anything, any advice? Can you know, our fav my favorite equation offer any advice? Well, I hope we've come to this deep realization that nominal debt is like equity, and that real debt is like debt. And any corporate finance tells you that some equity is a good thing. Equity provides a cushion so that you know, there's somebody who can take losses painlessly, and we don't have to go through all those bankruptcy costs anytime there's some loss. So, Equity cushions are good things, and we don't have them in, in the current system of sovereign debt. Well, what could we do? Um, and, and by the way, let me back up. Not only are equity cushions good things, we now want all our banks to have more equity because we've recognized that at least if there's some vague too big to fail guarantee, that may be a terrible system, but at least you guys got to go out and get a whole lot more equity if you're going to be too big to fail. That, that makes sense. But, we're not doing anything like that for countries. So maybe the middle road is to make countries have a greater equity cushion. Now, how can we do this? The first thing we could do is require countries to have much more long-term debt and not short-term debt. I mean, every financial crisis comes down to short-term debt. And Greece got into trouble, not so much because it had long-term budget problems that it couldn't solve. It got into trouble because it couldn't roll over short-term debt. When you have short-term debt, you have an asset that is, is subject to crises because you have to roll it over. You have to sell new debt in order to pay off the old debt. You have this, this long stream of taxes coming in, and you're issuing, you're rolling over short-term debt to finances. Did I say hedge fund? I mean, that's exactly the problem that the banking system had. They were rolling over overnight debt to hold mortgages. Well, a, a country that's rolling over overnight debt to, to fund a long series of taxes is in the same mess. So at least,
as we are now saying to banks, it's easy enough to say to governments, if you're going to be part of this system, and the implicit too big to fail kind of, you've got to issue a lot more long-term debt. I know you're going to say it's expensive. All the investment banks said it is expensive. But then you, you eliminate the rollover risk. You eliminate the possibility that, it, that you get into a liquidity squeeze uh, and, and when you're really solvent in the long run. So that makes sense. Apply the general lessons of banking reform to, to, to currencies and the, the, you know, the lessons of how you protect too big to fail to countries. The other, again, so I, I, will, I will end this section with a, uh, you know, a, a long-term deep thing. But again, we have to start thinking long-term rearranging these, these arrangements. Having your own countries like government equity, long-term debt sort of like equity, could we invent a better kind of government equity, a way that when it comes out that the books have been cooked and there aren't going to be any surpluses, why do we have to have a, 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 role, a financial crisis, a squeeze, a bunch of banks going down? Couldn't we have something like equity holders who just take the hit uh, and then go home and, and cry in their beer or, or their ouzo or whatever they're drinking, and, and that's that, and you don't have a financial crisis associated with it? How do we invent government equity, ways of, of absorbing these, these debts without crises? Well, fortunately, again, I'm inspired by a, uh, a French invention, so I have to be even to the English invented pre-commitment, but the French invented a system that amounts to government equity in the 1700s. So in 1700s France, there were, there were two, there were livres, which was the official unit of account, and there were écu, which was the medium of exchange. Nobody ever saw a livre. So if I, if I had promised to pay, if I had issued government debt, it would say, this will pay so many livres, but no one's ever seen a livre, so you just look up the exchange rate, and the government also said one livre is worth 100 écus. So we look it up, and then I, I actually hand you the gold coins. And every now and then, the government would get into trouble and would say, oh, by the way, sorry, a livre is now worth only 50 écus. And then, of course, it has to pay off less in its debts, and it also pays its, its workers less, because the work, all the contracts were in livre. They just invented government equity. They separated the medium of exchange from the unit of account, and in so doing, created a transparent way to default on your debts without the bankruptcy costs of default. Now, how could that work now? I'm thinking outside the box, but I want to encourage thinking outside the box. Suppose that, say, drachma were the official unit of account, and there was a promise, one drachma is worth one euro. Government debt is denominated in drachmas, uh, but all the currency is euros. Bank accounts are euros and completely free banking and, and international exchange. No one's ever seen a drachma. So the government gets into trouble, and what does it say? It's, and by the way, uh, pay, uh, payments to state employees are in drachmas. I'm, I'm sorry for those of you who are state employees here, but that's crucial to the system. When the government gets in trouble, it can just say, look, uh, sorry, uh, one drachma is worth 50 cents now. And what has it done? It's wiped, it's written down the value of its debt. It's written down all of its payments to state employees in, in, a, in a transparent way. Now you might say, well, why in the world would anybody, wouldn't they just keep devaluing forever? Well, interestingly, the, where I learned about uh, Livre et Necu was a, an article by Francois Valde, who was documenting a case where the France had done exactly the opposite. They had made the Livre worth more, and they did that because they were in good times and they wanted to build up their reputation so that they could borrow again in bad times. And the same reputational mechanism works there as well. Now, there's a deeper issue here. Equity comes with control rights. Why do you give money to a company and just count on them to pay you dividends and not just welch on the promise? Well, because if they do, the equity holders can take over the company and, and seize the assets. What are the control rights for sovereign debt? Well, that's the, sim that's the problem of, of making sovereign debt equity. The control rights is voters. Unhappy voters are the ones who complain when the government defaults on its debt or treats it like equity and, and, and stops paying interest. In fact, all the successful fiat currencies come from stable democracies. Uh, and, and so I think there is hope for something like government equity. Uh, in, in the context of a currency union, you can have the government equity, and then the defaults on government equity, the, not the defaults, but then the write down of government equity happens without screwing up every price in the economy, without screwing up international trade, without the chaos of ex explicit defaults, and it's monitored by, by angry voters. Uh, well, that's too late for, that's not how you get out of trouble. <laughs> that's how we might set things up next time around. <laughs>